when anyone has ever asked Alex in the past, why did you find, why did you start Home and Clumtastic? He always says to find hot tops. I think that's the absolute best way to describe the vibe of Home and Clumtastic. It's tongue in cheek, it's irreverent, and at the same time, um, really compassionate. I'm still astounded that there's not any more backstabbing in the group. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I, and I love it, I think it's fantastic. There's a huge percentage of people in America don't even know that West Virginia is a state. They think that it's Virginia, you know, and that's, I've encountered that so many times over the years, so a little weak on geography in America these days. I think growing up in West Virginia that your view of yourself tends to be the norm of your community, and even more so than in bigger cities where you had, would have more exposure to different cultural things. And so in West Virginia, it's sort of a group think amongst your town, and you never know anything different, or you're not exposed to any kind of stimul stimulation in order to be able to explore uh, avenues outside of what your family or your friends or your community generally thinks. It's a very eclectic culture here in Fayetteville, more diverse, you can go 20 miles either way and not have the same type of culture that you've got in Fayetteville. And it's because of the diversity of population that the rafting industry has brought into the area. So much more open, much more comfortable, a uh, lot more informed. Anyone's welcome, they're not judged. That's how I feel. And in this town, that is for sure, because there are people here that live a different lifestyle, that have grown up here, and they are very, very accepted. A lot of people are gonna need some reason to come to West Virginia, you know, they don't necessarily connect that this is a world-class climbing area right away. They hear there's climbing here, but they don't realize that this place is one of the best places in the world. And so you, you put on events, and uh, events drive business in this area, and it's been, it's been pretty successful. That's why I hold a convention here, because yeah, the climbing is amazing, and the town, the people are just wonderful, and they've been really great about our convention, and it's funny to me. I mean, I know what other people must expect because they are not from the South. I love that Fayetteville hosts Homo Climtastic because it just sort of puts the nail in that coffin that the Deep South is like gay haters <laughs> because they love us here. Like the locals in the bar, we had the drag show, I mean, who knew that the locals in the bar would still come in with the drag queen walking around? There's some flamboyant activity. Uh, there's a lot of smiling. Uh, there's a lot of happy people. Uh, and it's good for business, man. I mean, it's just like it's, this is a destination vacation spot, man. And a big group like that that decides to come to New River Gorge and spend some time here and enjoy everything, you know, I'm all for it, man. They're open, they're friendly, they, they like to have a good time, but they treat each other with respect and treat uh, everybody else with respect. And then you couple it with Fayetteville, which is this little eclectic culture, totally different than the rest of West Virginia, you know, situated here in the heart of the mountains. And I think it's the combination of the two. It kind of became the perfect world. It's like the way it really ought to be, you know? Ha <laughs> ha
<laughs> How did I think of the idea of starting Homo Clantastic? I had gym climbed for two years in Athens, Georgia. I had gone to Switzerland and learned to climb there outside and made all these friends, like right away, just one friend after another. I always had people to climb with, I always had people to go outside with. Um, it was so easy and then I came back and things were back to the way they used to be and I realized that it wasn't me, it was just the place that I was in at the time. And I was an outsider and so I didn't want to be the outsider anymore and, and I thought, well I knew that other people had to feel the same way somewhere else in the country so I decided that there had to be a, a space for people like us. And so I uh, posted some ads on the internet, the name, I don't know how I came up with a name, I just thought Homo Climtastic sounded funny. So I was doing the gym thing in grad school in Athens at University of Georgia and then this hot dude's walking around the bar in Athens, Georgia. I'm like, okay, hello, Alex Rowland. <laughs> so we ended up meeting and he's like, you look like you could be a climber. And I'm like, climb what? And then he took me to this railroad trestle in Athens. And I was like, this is ridiculous. What are we doing on this railroad trestle? And he taught me the ropes, like showed me how to clip all this crap. And I'm like, all right, I can do this. And so then he's like, all right, we're sitting in the last resort, which is a fabulous restaurant in Athens. And he's like, I'm starting a group called Homo Climbtastic. And we're going to make this happen. I was like, all right, count me in. So that's how that happened just pulling in gay climbers from everywhere. And we decided, well, we're gonna go to the New River Gorge. And if somebody shows up, that'll be it. <laughs> and then people showed up, so. What was my first impression of Alex? Um, it's funny because I was asking Chavez, you know, what are, what are Chris and, and Alex Rowland like? You know, I've never met them before. I can only deduce certain whatevers from their Facebook pictures. And all, all Chavez said was, you know, they're just really, they're just Southern. And when I met them, like before that, I didn't know what the hell Southern meant, right? Like I, I never went south of the Mason-Dixon line. So when I met them, it was just like, oh, they're really Southern. And Alex to me just talked really kind of slow. <laughs> but I think what I remember of Rio it was just that he was funny and cautious. This would be the two, two words that I would describe him with when I first saw him. You know, he was, he wanted to engage, but he kind of scopes you out first before he does. So I was downstairs in the hostel and I heard, I heard this explosion, this cacophony of voices on the, in the upper floor and I thought something was wrong. And then this guy with really, really big hair, Rio had huge hair uh, in 2009, comes in and he's like, girl! And I was, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's midnight, who is this? And he was so loud. I thought that like someone had broken in and we were getting fag dragged or something and so I ran upstairs and it was just Rio. <laughs> and he'd arrived and everyone was like, everyone was screaming and going, holy shit, Rio. And he was hugging everybody. And Rio's like, hey, and he gives me a big hug. And I'm like, I don't even know this guy. And your hair, it's everywhere, dude. Like kind of finding, finding him. I thought there was trouble and it turned out it was just Rio. And all these years later, I know that I was right. Rio is fantastic. He became like an instant friend. Uh, we just had an instant bond. We hit it off right away. He's just such a happy person. He's just a wonderful energy, he's so positive. I mean, he's, he's just one of the real forces in some ways behind this group. And, and he's a damn good climber. I think um, Kelly is a type of guy who must be like a Texas gentleman where when you first meet him, he's like, you know, it's nice to meet you. He's very um, Scottish, you know, he can put it on. Um, but it was only like afterwards and after the trip was going that I actually got to to see how goddamn funny he is and all the voices he can do and all the observations he makes about people. What I think of Kelly is us kind of being a little bit, what are you about? And then once we realized that we were on the same page about everything, having a great time. I know from reading his account that he was afraid that it would just be another shit show of gay people drinking and hooking up. And I knew that 
it wasn't going to be that way, that it was about climbing. Todd Presner and I hung out, um, and uh, we, we did a trip in Kentucky, and I got to know Todd a little bit, and he and I rode back into Lexington together. And uh, I don't know, Todd, you know, was married and had a kid, and I just felt like there was a lot about Todd that I could that I could learn from. We call him Hot Toddy and we call him Daddy Todd and like all this stuff and it's almost true because he really was sort of, for me, it was almost like a roadmap on how to do a gay relationship with kids and climb still and like, you know, how do you find time for all that stuff and he's been a valuable uh, person for me to, to get to know a little bit because he's he's been there and done that. The Climb Tasty Convention is a place to be who you are and do what makes you happy. It's just, you're here to be who you are, and I think straight people, gay people, we all live under this pressure to like find a mate or something. And I think we actually kind of remove that in a way. I mean, it's, you're free to do it if you want, but I think when you have climbing to focus on and rafting to focus on, you're not, you're not caught up in the magazine imagery and the TV imagery of finding someone do some, you know, your soulmate and all that crap. How would I describe the homo Climbtastic weekend? Um, the best line and the easiest line to react to is the, the Lollapalooza of gay rock climbing. I really want it to be a celebration of rock climbers who just so happen to be gay. It's really what I want it to be all about. Uh, I never want it to be like those god-awful gay cruises where you're just like, that's just a club in the middle of the fucking ocean. Like, that's stupid. And while, you know, shenanigans totally happen, sure, by all means, um, at the end of the day, I still want it to be about rock climbing and about climbing hard and um, climbing well and climbing safely. Because that's, to me, what's important, and that's what brought me to Homo Climbtastic in the first place. You know, the, the vibe of it is, is like, show up and have a really fantastic time and you're gonna be taken care of on top of that. Like, we're not this group who's just gonna like, you know, set you out to pasture or whatever. You know, when you show up, you've got a campground and if you have questions, there are all these people around who wanna help you out. The vibe of it, I think, is irreverent, um, silly, fun, and, and at the same time, really compassionate. That was, that was the only one at the time, I think, that was coming from the West Coast. And I had no idea, I, I didn't know anyone. And I was like, you know, I wanna go climbing. West Virginia, that sounds good. Gay climbers in West Virginia, that sounds interesting. So I called Alex up and I was like, and he convinces me that this is all good, all kosher. And I said, all right, I'll book a ticket. And I just showed up at midnight, I think, into the airport. They picked me up, very sweet. And uh, yeah, we climbed for four days and I was totally addicted. I was like, wow, this uh, New River Gorge, nothing like that. I mean, I just hadn't climbed the kind of style before in, in the West and uh, enjoyed the people and... Uh, yeah, I've been back ever since. Bouldering, sport climbing, and trad. You have uh, bouldering, I guess, takes its name, obviously, from the fact that there's just big boulders, and generally only 10 feet high and you just climb a little section of the boulder and get to the top, and the strength is enormous. You're using a tremendous amount of power to get through this one 10-foot piece. With sport climbing, you're going, you have these bolts that you're clipping your rope into every 10 feet, and so the routes can be as long as you want them, actually. Generally, with single pitch climbing, like what we do here, the climbs are maybe 80 feet high at the most. So it's a different experience, and the, the puzzle is oftentimes being able to climb 80 feet without tiring, more so than just figuring out the one hardest move like it is with bouldering. And then trad climbing, you don't have the pre-drilled in bolts. You just have gear that you slot in to protect the climb so that you can attach your rope in and have something that's going to keep you up there if you fall. I'm Jim Logan. Sometimes now I'm Jamie Logan. Well, I, when I was 11 years old, I went climbing with some World War II uh, Army 10th Mountain Division veterans, and they tried to climb a, a cliff and couldn't do it, and so I said, could I do it? So they let me actually, at the age of 11, 
lead a pitch of rock climbing with pitons and a rope. And at the top, I put in some pins and clipped carabiners into them and lowered off. And they were not able to follow the pitch. <laughs> but I didn't really start climbing until 63, 64, when I went to a private school where I talked him into having a climbing team. When I started really becoming a pretty good climber, we did it all with pitons. And then pretty early in my career, I had the opportunity in probably 1966 or 67, I climbed with Royal Robbins the first time that he brought uh, passive gear, nuts and equipment from England and sort of opened our eyes to the possibilities. So then myself and all my friends, we started actually making things to use for nuts, to use for passive protection. And when I say nuts, it actually literally included machine nuts, which we would thread with slings and then put in cracks. We made the first portal edges. Uh, I made the first good direct aid hook. Uh, I worked for Ed Leeper. We made Leeper pitons. And I made, made the first nut tools, the, the basic nut tool that people have now. We made the very first ones of those, that shape. Um, yeah, it's been, I've enjoyed being a part of the development of the activity over time. Sport climbing is a very, it gets, it, it makes the sport more accessible to people. You know, there's certainly an environmental argument against it, and there's certainly some sort of climbing traditional ethics argument against sport climbing. But honestly, you know, it has its place. And uh, my attitude has always been if you, uh, if you preserve the integrity of the first ascent, if something was done as a, a you know, a traditional climb, you know, keep it that way. But if a route is done as a first ascent as a sport climb, great, keep it that way. Different climbing areas um, offer different sort of stone, of course. And uh, you go to any different climbing area and they've got a lot of, New River Gorge has a lot of 12As. Uh, you know, Seneca's got a lot of famous Seneca 9 pluses. Moore's Wall has a lot of 510s. And when you advance, you know, personally from a grade to something else where the, the, it's not available at the cliff and it does not offer safe natural protection, then that's when that shift came for me. And it came for me after I started climbing with Doug Reed and started at Moore's Wall with a route called the Recommendation. We'd asked Tim how to get to the top of it because we were going to wrap down and equip it. And he said, I have no recommendation. So uh, that became the name of the route. The climbing at the new, it's really, it's pretty special in that not only the quality of the rock, the consistent quality of the rock, and the variety, and in terms of styles too, you can have, you know, kind of the juxtaposition of sport and trad climbing at any given cliff. We have a very arbitrary way of describing the difficulty of a climb, and we grade them according to basically how hard the first person who climbed them thought they were, which obviously lends itself to a great many problems because the first ascensionist is oftentimes a tall man. So the grades will not be correct for people who are not tall men about 70% of the time. I just think for women and I think for shorter people, it's much less predictable. I mean, it's already unpredictable for me to say what grade I climb. You know, and it's funny because you will, I'll get on a route that is uh, obviously for short people and then I, you know, start crying because I can't get up it and then all my short friends can. I enjoy all kinds of climbing. Um, I mean, pretty much exclusively route climbing, uh, but it can be sport or trad climbing. I'm inspired by big long climb, so big wall climbing usually. With trad climbing, I'm climbing these days up to 13B and then sport climbing up to 13C. That'll just go up and down according to my fitness. It's important for me to have specific goals and then that'll like bring my climbing up a little bit more each time. I certainly get most inspired by the roots that make me draw from my from my whole toolbox, and that's that's going to be longer routes. I mainly boulder, but I can sport climb if I had to. I'm training for this uh, pro tour comp in September that's in Seattle, so I've been doing that for the past three months, and this trip kind of lands smack dab in the middle, so I was like, oh, it'll be fun to sport climb for a little bit. So I've been doing a lot of power endurance training, which translates to steep 
uh, sport climbing. Most of my climbing partners climb weaker than I do, and it's a reality that I have to encourage them on like B5s, and it's something that I may have warmed up on, but I'm still right behind them, spotting them, yelling at them to pull a little harder. So I have this theory about rock climbing, and it's probably more pertinent to bouldering, but there's the strategic climber, and then there's the victory climber. And the victory climber is someone who goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and is like bloody and it's kind of like the Rocky in the Rocky saga that like goes and goes and fights and fights and it's kind of the underdog and then eventually they just get it and they're bloody and they're crying and they're on the top of the boulder and they're just like, yes, I just did it. And then I kind of lean more towards the strategic climber where I work it and I work it and I take breaks, I come back another day and then I come in and I'm like, I'm gonna do it today. I'm pretty confident in it and I feel really solid. I make it look pretty good, effortless, and I don't have bloody hands or tears coming out of my eyes. Um, so the times where I have been the victory climber, I am very like, oh my god, I just did this climb. Like, this is amazing. I'm on the verge of crying. And the times where I've been the strategic climber, I'm very like, done and done, ready for the next one. It's a weird kind of balance between the two. Climbing is the type of sport that requires thinking, right? You have to be strategic about it. You can't beefcake your way up a climb. That's not that's inefficient and that's not going to work. Um, so the strongest climbers and the climbers that are, are in it almost for life, they're very logical and they don't they they have to think. So I think we like as climbers or as queer climbers, kind of have it easy. We're we're involved with a community that's gonna think about the situation first rather than react. I like to think that. I would consider myself primarily a sport climber. Um, second uh, would be bouldering. Uh, I have to learn how to climb trad because um, I'm such a freaking pansy. Uh, and on the pansy note, the hardest send was a 12A, so I need to get stronger very quickly. I would like to be a big, strong climber when I grow up. Well, I hadn't really been climbing much, so I'd been in a period in my life when I was really busy raising children and working and going to school. So this friend said, there's a new thing that I think you'll like, let's go climbing. And we went up and he said, this is called sport climbing and there's a row of bolts. And all we do is we have quick draws and we put quick draws on the bolts and we climb up. And I said, oh, okay. And so we did a climb and I thought, well, this is pretty fun. It's easy and you can climb way harder than you could, you know, putting gear in and stuff. And so pretty quickly, I really, liked doing it and it wasn't a challenge for me as it was for some people that it was somehow wrong to be bolting things so you could climb on them. I like the movement of it, I like the gymnastic quality. For me, I personally embrace sport climbing really quickly. But I was still always doing trad climbing and going in the mountains and doing all the different kinds of climbing. I'm five seven and a half, uh, so I fit on the sort of shorter, compact, more kind of gymnastic like I enjoy routes that are primarily overhung and kind of muscular. I also enjoy kind of balancey routes uh, as well, where you have to have kind of more delicate movement. You know, I can't do reachy things. I tend not to be super dynamic as a climber, so I really haven't excelled at bouldering. I do boulder a lot, but um, sort of hit a wall uh, at some point where I just am not willing to push it that much further for fear of injury or falling really hard. Thinking back my own training, because I learned trad climbing first, you don't do much dynamic motion. You're not jumping for things. You're not uh, out of control, kind of lunging for things. It's extremely static, controlled climbing. And that's how I learned to climb. And so that's still, despite the fact now that I climb significantly harder than that when I first started, I still do most moves statically. And I think that's in some ways a liability, but it also it's my, it's my style. Um, fits my body type and maybe my mental sense of wanting to more or less be in control. It's also pretty amazing to watch the different styles that people have. I mean, not to say that women and men climb fundamentally differently, but often they do climb differently. And often this is, has to do with, you know, body size, tall folks versus short folks. I mean, people who are very, lots of upper body versus people who have lots of flexibility and balance. And everyone brings their strengths and, and their weaknesses, you know, to climb. What I think is great about Homo Climbtastic is there's really there's no, no, no judgment, everyone's supported. If you're just starting out, you know, you're climbing 5'6", or you're climbing 5'14". Um, everyone has something to learn. 
um, and everyone can learn from each other. I think the dynamic is different when there's lots of LGBT people climbing together. It doesn't have to be all of them. In fact, I think it hurts when that's all that there is. You know, there has to be people of all stripes. But the social dynamic you have where we're in the majority just makes for a very different experience. And if, if, if you were in some parallel universe where uh, straight people were in the minority, I think you'd have the same kind of fun there uh, if you had inverted it. Even if they weren't discriminated against in the way that we are, you would still have kind of a fun, quirky uh, universe to live in. I, I think this question, like, how does that, how does the Como Climbtastic group differ from other, like, climbing groups? I think it almost stems or parallels the question of why would you want to climb with other gay climbers? Or, and, and it's almost bigger, like, why would you need a social group like that? At the end of the day, it's the conversation, right? There are certain jokes that you can make that people automatically understand. There's a certain lexicon that automatically, that you know that that person gets, so you don't have to adjust it. And also, I think every queer person out there has to quickly judge, should I come out to this person? Should I not come out to this person? Even at the bar, while they, they generally know if you were to meet them at a gas station or something, should you talk to them or not? So I think Homo Climtastic is this catalyst that lets you um, kick off those secondary questions to yourself, and you can just talk the talk and be funny and climb fucking hard. <laughs> when you can do an activity with a lot of gay people and have fun, it's like it changes the game. It's not just being a part of gay culture, it's doing something that you like doing with the camaraderie of your friends. And regardless of whether or not they're gay, we have straight people that come to home climbtastic conventions, so, you know, Bonding with the, the gay people is a little easier because we have like a lot of shared, you know, stuff there. But the fact that we're all here for the same reason, it takes a little bit of the awkwardness out of meeting, you know, saying hi. You know, I walked around the first day, people asked if I was on crack because I was so laughy and, you know, happy introducing myself to everybody. But, you know, I don't do crack. <laughs> Being a boulder and climbing kind of harder grades, you tend to hang out with a lot of straight guys, and that's like my main clan. And when I hang out with them, I'm a certain way. When I come here, it's definitely different. Like, we check out guys, and it's like, I couldn't do that with my pros. It'd be like, hey, what's up? Like, look at that guy. <laughs> He's pretty cute, right? Uh, so it's a little different. It's fun. Um, it's not any more freeing than it is hanging out with my straight buddies, but it is definitely another side of me that I don't get to indulge in as much. If you laugh, I'll walk you back to your car And we can talk about the things that you are If you tie, I can watch the road If you burden I'd be your man. 
I think the first moment that I realized that I was attracted to men, I was in the second grade, and there was this kid named Ian that I was friends with, and uh, he came to stay the night, like we were friends, and we, we would go stay the night with each other, whatever. And I wound up working really hard to marry Ian. And I'm, like in the second grade, I was trying to marry Ian. And uh, my mom found out about it and just fucking flipped out. But um, that was, that, like, er, that early on I realized that um, something about that was was appealing to me. Like there was something, and I, I, I picked up two messages from that. The first one was that I wasn't like the other kids, and the second one was that um, it was bad. And so it was a pretty, it was a pretty uh, traumatic thing to learn at that age, I think. I think when I was a kid, I hoped it would go away. I thought it would maybe puberty would reset it. And, and I find myself rewriting history in my head that I was always okay with it, which is not true. I really wasn't. I think even after I came out at 17, I wouldn't, I would never be talking about sexual orientation the way that I talk about it now. The way that I talked about it at 19 was probably pretty different too. So, you know, you, you like to think that that there's some switch, uh, but it's more of one of those lighting dials <laughs> that you very slowly over, you know, two decades turn on. Uh, when I was in college, I had the experience, but um, after coming out, I guess I had always known, and I guess that's what made it even harder for me to sort of accept that, is that I was always different. I had a Sunday school teacher. I found out later that I had a Sunday school teacher tell my parents that I might be gay. And when I found that out, I thought that was the weirdest thing ever, because, you know, I was raised in the church, you know, I like a good southern boy raised in the church, but um, I didn't really expect anything like that because I didn't know what gay was when I was a kid, so how would I have known? I think that I've, I've known for as, as long as I could sort of, as my sexuality was forming, I had some awareness of feeling different, not being that interested in, like, in the list of potential boyfriends that my girlfriends and I would make. <laughs> so. It was in eighth grade for sure. I kind of knew throughout middle school and then in eighth grade I had a friend who was good looking to me and we were really best friends actually at the time and I was like, oh for sure, like definitely gay. And by the time high school rolled around, I was out to all my friends. Um, growing up in the Bay Area, it was really easy to come out. So it was easy to accept it too, so. You know in elementary school, <laughs> when everyone's like, oh, it's like scrambly porn. I kind of caught myself looking more at the guy, and I was like, oh, looking more at the guy. That's something. <laughs> and that's, that was kind of that tipping point for me. <laughs> scrambly porn and stupid shitty friends you don't talk to anymore. I think when I became sexually aware, <laughs> I think I was, I realized, I mean, maybe it what, age 10 or 11? I mean, it was never a question for me. I, I, my father was a biologist, and he had biology books at home. I would look up things, and they would say, oh, homosexuality is found in every species. And I was like, well, good, because it's found in me. And I thought that was, and that was kind of a, a self it was very self-reassuring at the time, and we didn't have, you know, obviously there was no web. I didn't go online. There were no chat forums, things like that. I just really liked women and I just wanted to be with them and I wanted to wear women's clothes and I wasn't a, a kid that wanted to play with Barbies. I never played with Barbies or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think I ever thought to myself that as a little kid, oh I want to be a girl. But I have memories of a long time ago when I was pretty small probably of some British army officer who had transitioned from being a macho British army guy to being a woman. And I remember this picture of him. I clearly remember this picture of him with like an Angora sweater and a tweed skirt sitting there. And I thought, oh, I would really like that. You know, I was probably 15 years old or something. And that was really, I can remember that picture totally clearly 50 years later. So I think it's something that I always 
wanted. You have to remember there was no internet. So at that time, if you thought you were weird, you were kind of weird by yourself. You couldn't really say to anybody, oh, this is what I think. Or you couldn't go on the internet and go, oh, look, there's other people like me. <laughs> this, is, this is a thing. Um, so I think it was pretty lonely, actually, in that regard. My family's weird. They're, they, they know there's just this huge river in Egypt called the Nile, and that's what they're sailing down. So it's okay. And, you know, we don't talk about anything like that. We don't talk about girls. We don't talk about boys. They barely ask anything about my life. Uh, that's kind of comfortable to me, and it's kind of uncomfortable at the same time. I wish I had some sort of relationship like that. So, uh, Freshman year of college, so four years ago, five years ago. Um, I moved out and I was like, this is a great time to come out to my parents <laughs> now that I'm not living at home. And I did, and everything's good. It's funny because there are families out there who took it a lot better than mine did at first, but never really came to accept who their children were or who their siblings were. So I want to give them credit for, for being a much more accepting family than I think what a lot of people ever have. Uh, you know, but I can't whitewash it and say that it didn't suck at first. I mean, it was bad for like two years before I really made any kind of headway. My parents were very supportive. Um, I think they were surprised. Um, it was, but it was really a, a non-issue. I think I was really very lucky to have such a supportive family. I mean, my parents, my, my grandmother actually was extremely liberal, progressive. She grew up on Miami Beach, uh, was a, you know, a, a sort of a refugee Jewish family there. But she also knew where all the gay bars were. I and mean, it's quite amazing to ask her, an 88-year-old woman to like, well, I think that's the tranny bar over there. And that's actually Leather Night. And, and she was amazing. And she knew all these places. And so it was pretty fun to go to the Miami Beach when I was in the, the mid-90s when she would just kind of describe everything that was happening there. I came out to my family, and uh, my dad disowned me when I was 19. And so uh, I didn't have parents from about 19 on. My mom still kind of hung around a little bit, but um, my, my dad disowned me, and so I didn't go home for Christmas and all that kind of stuff for a long time. So I had to sort of forge my own path, the little, you know, little stranded orphan gay kid or whatever. But um, it was good. It was it actually worked out really well for me because I'd, I, uh, I learned to be more independent. And my dad came around eventually. Um, they were at my wedding. My, my husband and I met through Glam, and uh, my parents were at my wedding. Both of my parents were at my wedding, and the, both the kids were in the wedding. And so it was this, yeah, I've got two boys, and um, I keep telling them that uh, even if they're heterosexual, um, I'll still love them. And even if they identify with the gender into which they were born, I will still love them. But, you know, it just makes it a little harder. I was primarily raised by my mom and, and that side of the family. Um, and what had happened was we were at a Thai restaurant. <laughs> and she was basically like, so you haven't had a girlfriend in a long time. And I was just like, oh, God, are we having this conversation? <laughs> and that's basically how it happened. In terms of how they feel about it, like they don't really care. Um, Especially recently, and especially having moved to not only just the, the West Coast, but to the U.S., my mom's just been like, can you just find a freaking boyfriend already and stop being like this dirtbag rock climber hippie? So I think she wants me to settle down now and behave. For a while, I just really told myself that there were options there, like that I should explore more. And instead that just really stifled my sexuality and um, because I wasn't allowing myself to explore being in relationships with women. Um, and so I came out to my family when I was 21, 20 or 21. And uh, I mean, it was a small process, but they've been really, really supportive and uh, makes a huge difference. I always feel like the oddball in that respect. Like, everybody's just way out and proud. And I mean, if you see me on the street, I mean, I have no qualms. I mean, look at me, I'm, it's 
blind and deaf people know, but my parents just, I don't want to push that issue. <laughs> so all my life, basically, I've always wanted to be a woman. And I never told anybody. I basically have been closeted for 65 years. And I told my wife, and it sort of evolved. And in the past two or three years, I've been going to therapy, and I've outed myself to my children and my close friends and my family and sort of accidentally in the climbing community. And I was pretty terrified of what that would mean to my social relationships in the climbing community. So in, in my gym, there's this whole crew of what I think of as the 514 girls. Um, and, you know, they, they're professional climbers and they work out all the time. So there's who's there in the daytime a lot. So one day I walked in and, and um, all of them came up and hugged me. And I'm like, what's going on? And then my friend Dana came over and said, well, you told Jesse Huey and Jesse told Olivia and Olivia told everybody. And, um, and I, it was actually kind of like a big relief, like it was okay. And so that was nice, but I still am trying to figure out how I want to be in the world. And it's confusing to me. And it's sort of an evolutionary process I'm going through of trying to figure out where I fit in the gender spectrum. I don't have the answer. My mother-in-law thinks I'm much nicer as a woman than I am as a man. <laughs> and, um, but it's very difficult for my wife. And we've been spending a lot of time working on it. And I, um, I've been married for 32 years and uh, would very much like to stay married. But it's challenging to her. And so we, we work on that. It's not just realizing that you're attracted to people of the same gender. It's realizing that you don't present uh, your gender in the same way that other people do and that other people don't either and that, that that's okay and that, that takes a while I mean I know the I know I know the club is called homo climbtastic uh, but when when I started it that feeling of a of, not being part of the in crowd applied applies to a lot of people and still does i think people i think if no one's ever experienced what it's like to feel different what it's like to be um to feel outside of the culture to not know what bathroom to go in to um it's really hard for normal people to understand what that would feel like and so i think there's a kind of a bond through that any people that have experienced that sort of outsidedness have. Uh, it, it was a struggle growing up in Georgia as a homosexual because uh, it's not very friendly. Atlanta is a very welcoming and friendly environment, but I came from a small town on the outskirts of Atlanta, and it wasn't a big thing. Nobody knew anything about that. I had no close friends middle school and high school just because it's just a disaster. I was the weird kid that didn't play sports. I grew up in this small shitty town in West Texas and there was no, there were no other gay people and there was this, you know, always this threat that I was going to get found out or something. I was going to get strung up and shot and uh, um, I started climbing and and, you know, sports has never been like a gay thing for when I grew up. I'm, I'm 36, and so I was growing up in like, you know, the mid-90s, and there were gay people, but definitely not in West Texas, and sports was definitely not for gay people. When I started the club, I started it in Athens, Georgia, because nobody wanted to climb with me. I, I was lucky if I could find an outdoor-capable climbing partner. The reason I think it's confusing to people is because they bandy about that thought of homophobia, of this, this fear of gay people, and then no, they don't fear gay people, they just think of them as some other group that probably should be, maybe not even should be, but don't they have other friends? You know, I, I, I have no reason to invite this person out on a climbing trip, but when you're the only one there, and they're everyone there, that means you are by yourself in the lunchroom. I mean, this is getting personal, but you know, I had a climbing partner uh, back when I was first learning, and we got through some pretty 
crazy routes together. I was teaching myself trad, which is never a good idea, and he was blaming me, and you know, we, we did silly things like that. I told him I was gay, boom, didn't want to climb with me again. Years go by, you know, I've been putting up flyers for the club and you know, whatever, I have like lots of members going to the gym, the dynamic's different, and he wants to climb with me again. And it was the same with lots of other people that, you know, were definitely kind of like, is this guy gonna make me look gay or is this guy gonna be a weirdo or whatever? Uh, so it's very easy to see exactly, it's not just in my head, you can see it as the various variables change, um, how much sexuality impacts your social environment uh, and just in the rock climbing universe. I think that people think that gays and lesbians are these exotic, you know, creatures who are, are at one hand interesting to look at on television, but can be very life-threatening up and up close, like a like in a zoo or something like that. And I think the more that individuals are are exposed to just how normal and how boring we are in our lives, that our the that our agenda, the gay agenda, is to raise our kids. Our gay agenda is to have good health care. Our gay agenda is to shop at the farmer's market. Our gay agenda is to go to the PTA meetings. Our gay agenda is to go rock climbing. Um, but that's our, that's our agenda, is just to live a normal, boring life like everybody else. It's, it's frustrating not to have the same rights as heterosexual couples. It's incredibly frustrating. Like David right now is trying to change his last name to Gray, and we've got to go through this, you know, there's legal process, and we've got to shit changed, and there's all the, there are all these things that he has to go and actually physically do. And, you know, if, if we were legally married, that just sort of comes with the territory. You just, oh, yeah, well, I got married, and this is my new last name, and everything sort of just gets modified. And, you know, society's really set up for that. And um, that's frustrating. Um, I can't get him on my, my uh, I can't get him on my insurance at work, you know. Um, our son, our, our adoption process, like, we have to live in this certain county to be able to adopt um, our youngest. <laughs> like, and we've got to find the right judge to do a dual parent adoption so that we can both be adoptive parents for him. So it's incredibly frustrating. There's a lot about, there's a lot about being in Texas and I think being in the United States in general that's really frustrating for, to, to try and put together a family, an LGBT family. And it's, you know, it's a miracle many of us do it because it's, I mean, it, the odds are stacked against us. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we adopted um, my son, his name is Mateo, in 2008. He was born on July 5th, 2008. He left the hospital 48 hours later with us, like his two dads. Um, kind of weird and amazing to like have the, like, oh, <laughs> so we got a baby now, and this is where you put the bottle, <laughs> and this is how the diaper works. I mean, we didn't know anything. I um, mean, the nurses were really sweet. Um, he was adopted in Colorado. Um, it's actually an open adoption. An open adoption basically means that you know the, the birth mother and you, may, you have a relationship uh, in some ways with her um, as that she becomes part of your extended family. Um, obviously, Mateo will probably ask, you know, say, okay, I have two dads, so who's my mom? Um, and so we wanted to be able to answer that question for him. And um, so we've maintained uh, a relationship with her. And he's, uh, yeah, he's now four. And hopefully he'll be on his first homo climbtastic trip when he's five. I think that's the, that's the minimum age I've decided. As a physician, let me give you a real life example of, of what I've encountered over the last several years in West Virginia. Um, there are 40,000 LGBT individuals in West Virginia, according to the 2010 census data. And there are almost 3,000 same-sex couples, a quarter of whom are raising children currently. And there are so many more who want to be parents, but they're afraid because they don't know how to go about the adoption process. Do they, how do they find a surrogate? And so it's not uncommon um, for me to have same-sex couples come from various parts of the state to my practice for uh, fertility services and to deliver um, here in Lewisburg because they want to have a same-sex physician who understands them, um, who understands their situations, so they feel comfortable in that. And so it's kind of um, a sad commentary that throughout the entire state that this can't be something that's just a common practice, that every patient, no matter what their sexuality, should be treated with the same respect and dignity and courtesy and professionalism as any other patient. The process of accepting uh, my being gay and sort of the 
counteracting, mentally counteracting some of the negativity has been, it's a process for me. Um, and I look at kids nowadays and I'm like so grateful that like it's easier because I see that I see these queer proms and like, you know, they've, the, the, the kids nowadays don't give a shit. Like most of the kids, like my 15 year old, his friends, they don't give a shit. Gay, straight, black, white, like none of it. Um, and when I was coming out, it was definitely not like that. And so some of it is looking at society and seeing how much it's changed. And that really validates a lot of, you know, like, oh, well, you know, the messages that I received when I was that age were wrong. And, you know, I can move on from that and, and sort of work on recovering. And I've done a little therapy and, you know, had a couple of bottles of wine and, you know, here I am. So um, it was either really, I think at the end of the day, it's either accept yourself or, or you know, fucking end it. And I'm too pretty to end it, so I didn't. What I think Homo Contastic has done for so many people is really offered a very positive venue uh, to support one another. And many folks here have faced a lot of very significant life challenges um, with their families being thrown out of their households, you know, homes are being gay. They're facing maybe gender identity issues um, that haven't been resolved. They're facing sexual identity issues alcoholism. I mean, we also have folks who are also battling their own, you know, internal battles of different things. I mean, people who are, you know, HIV positive, people who have multiple sclerosis. And they use climbing as a very productive venue, I think, to still remain engaged, to meet people, to push themselves as a positive experience. I mean, that's really what's so exciting about what this group is about. It's that opportunity for community and really just kind of energy. Homo Climbtastic definitely helped me um, be a little more proud to be gay, be a little more accepting of the different types of gay people like you know dudes are dirty and gross and gay dudes are dirty and gross too. It's like okay well, that's cool but dudes can also be clean and tidy. You know I try to be clean and tidy. But there's a whole gamut of, of the gay spectrum and, and I think that really pulled me into that and let me see that there's more to it. I was trying to climb this um, steep climb, it was 12B, I think, and I was coming out over the crux, and I remember Rio yelling, go girl, go girl, and I, kinda, I just thought, I like that. <laughs> I have changed completely from this sort of, I, I never really had a lot of confidence, and I never really had a lot of, I never saw myself as maybe being someone who could start a gay and lesbian climbing club. <laughs> And, uh, and, and climbing in general and homoclontastic in particular have changed a lot of that about me. How did homoclontastic affect my life? It's a, it's a, it is a profound question. Um, it's amazing how much you, you like being around these people uh, and also how much you like the climbing. I've uh, I found a lot of inspiration watching people climb, uh, learning about people's backgrounds and stories, the kind of things they've overcome, you know, personal things they've overcome in their lives. Um, it really, it, it, it gives you a signal about the resilience of the human spirit. I mean, it really is. I've loved the experience. I, I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great group of people and, and the climbing is, well, equally good. It can accomplish things that no other setup can. And I didn't really realize at first all that it could do. I just thought it would probably be a good idea. You know, why not try it, see what happens. And then as we drew in people from around the country, I realized the way that it networked people, you know, I can go on Facebook and I can see that there are people I have never met before, either one, who are climbing with each other and just totally random parts of the world all over the place because of Homo Climtastic, the chain of events, or they just attended a function that kind of spawned off of Homo Climtastic or whatever. So just to, to see that domino effect that it has is incredible, and I, and I feel, to me, that's the most important reason it exists. What would my life be like without Homo Climtastic? You know, I would still have climbing in my life, but I don't know if climbing would be as fun as it is. I almost don't want to think about what my life would be like without Homo Climtastic. For me, this, you know, skinny kid from Toronto has managed to make friends from the Atlantic to the Pacific uh, who are pretty much very similar to me. As a result of coming to Homo Climtastic, I met my husband and now I have, you know, we have kids and, you know, the people who were in my wedding were, were 
people that I met through rock climbing and, and throughout through Homo Climbtastic. Like it's it's become a very uh, a very pivotal part of my life, and it, it turns out that 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 trip all those years ago ch changed a lot about my life. You know, my my life today wouldn't look anything like it was if it wasn't for 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 this club. It's a great network, uh, and you I think you develop some pretty intense friendships because of the intensity of climbing. I mean, sometimes uh, your friendships, I think, intensify very quickly because of the nature of what you're doing with other folks. So it's not really a casual, hey, what's up? Let's, you know, play whatever sport it may be, you know, casually. This is, it is life and death. I mean, the person who's belaying you is responsible for your life. I mean, they have to catch you. Um, if they screw up, you'll probably be injured or die. So it's a pretty significant thing. It's a significant commitment. The relationships in some way between climber and belayer is a very uh, special relationship. You want to know your belayer very well. You often become friends with these folks because, uh, you know, you, in some ways, they're out there saving your life every time. I have any further aspirations for Homo Climbtastic? I just, I want everybody to feel as free and funny and wonderful as they do here all the time. Bam. So it, it should, the bigger it gets, the better. There's really no limit to me to the level of comfort that the people have here with themselves and with who they are and what they do. And I wish everyone felt that way. And I think everyone feels restricted in that way, regardless of who they are. I have this very fundamental desire, I think, to make people happy. And the queer rights movement has taken people who were just miserable in their lives and allowed them to just shine. And it's done that for people who aren't even queer in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so that, that's why I do it. It's a positive venue for young people to find support and self-worth and dignity. And that's, uh, I think, really at the core of this. I mean, yes, we climb. It's, uh, climbing is great. You know, I think I love the beauty, but it's also about human dignity and caring for each other. And I think that is like the untold story of uh, Homo Clantastic. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Surprise me. Okay, okay. I'll call out that queen later. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, you're going to say this. Oh, what? Um, how big is my wiener? <laughs> yeah, how big is your so wiener? so big. Okay. I can barely fit in these shorts. <laughs> um. <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> I feel ridiculous. That's okay. I'm really uncomfortable. <laughs> I'll jump to get everything you fit. Bitch, owes me five dollars in the first place. <laughs> Are you re rolling? Yeah. Okay. okay. So we got that. We got that. I know that sounds almost bridezilla. I don't want to be bridezilla. Like, <laughs> yay, it's a reunion. We have so much fun. Great. I already got it. You just said it, so that's good. <laughs> so long as you include the part about bridezilla. Dane, you just passed me this time. I'm gonna. Down. It's okay. It's really hot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I sweat a lot too. Because I sweat so much. <laughs> I, what else is left to say? Oh my god, it's awful. <laughs>
<laughs> I need to... <laughs> what more can I give? My heart here on a plate. <laughs>